Shalom. This week's Torah portion is Parshat Balak, the seventh Torah portion in Sefer Bamidbar, the Book of Numbers. As we learned in last week's portion of Chukat, now that the generation of the desert has passed and the decree of 40 years of wandering in the wilderness has ended, now the children of Israel are preparing to soon cross the Jordan and enter into the land that God promised them. There, in accordance with God's plan, they are to become a source of blessing for the entire world. And the reality of the one God will be revealed in a new way for the entire world. It will be the start of a new era of hope for mankind. But there are those who have a different agenda, and they're not looking forward to this. Not at all. This new era does not fit in with their plans. Such a shift will threaten to undermine the illusion of their own power that they've worked so hard to create. They will no longer be in control. For these miscreants, the very existence of Israel and her entrance into the land as God intended spells disaster, and thus the situation is desperate. And desperate situations call for desperate measures. Onto this scene, our portion opens. King Balak of Moab seeks to hire Bilam, a spiritualist with dark powers, to curse the children of Israel in an effort to drive them away from the land. This Bilam fellow has a, quite a history. He's been around for a long time and he's been spewing evil for a long time. As one of the original advisors to Pharaoh, it had been his idea to drown all the Jewish baby boys back in Egypt. Later, he became an itinerant interpreter of dreams and a magician, but he was spiritual by nature and possessed unique spiritual powers. He had the potential to be truly great. Hashem gave him the opportunity to be a prophet to the nations, as Moshe was a prophet to Israel, and he left it up to him to choose how to use his powers. But make no mistake, Bilam knew Hashem. Hashem allowed himself to be known to Bilam. He allowed Bilam to experience something of his presence, but Bilam's relationship with the Creator was twisted. It was centered on his desire to try and manipulate God to do his own bidding. He was like the negative image of Moshe, and the way he acted was the very opposite of how a prophet should behave. The prophets of Israel all identified with and channeled the attribute of divine mercy. They came as Hashem's agents to address moral failure and to try to fix it, to warn people against sin and to educate them. And they did not come in the service, in the service of the nation of Israel alone. The Hebrew prophets were concerned with fixing the whole world, and they feel the pain of the whole world. And thus they chastised and warned the nations as well. And when they did not succeed, they expressed their deep concern over what will happen to them. As Jeremiah laments in chapter 48 and verse 36, my heart moans for Moab like flutes. But Bilam came to curse an entire nation for no reason. He could have used his power otherwise. He could have done great things in the world, but he chose to use his power for destruction. Hashem tells Bilam, you can go with the men all right, but only the thing that I shall speak to you, that shall you do. Bilam meets with Balak and instructs him to erect seven altars for the offering of seven bulls and seven rams in order for him to receive divine inspiration. But as everyone knows, Hashem put the words in his mouth and changed his curses into blessings. Balak moves Bilam to different vantage points, trying to get a better look at the camp of Israel, repeating this bizarre procedure three times. But Bilam constantly utters blessings in the place of curses. In our Jerusalem Lights podcast this week, we examine Bilam the man and the unusual nature of his prophetic ability and how it all plays out in our portion. But for now, today, now I would like to focus on these blessings, these blessings themselves. Bilam's curses turned to blessings are truly remarkable. Actually, they comprise some of the most uplifting and beautiful verses in Torah. It may seem surprising that some of this evil person's blessings, such as the famous Matovu Ohalech Yaakov, how goodly are your tents, O, o Jacob, They've even been incorporated into our daily prayers, and other parts are included in the Rosh Hashanah prayers. So open up your heart. The blessing's most extraordinary aspect, most extraordinary aspect of all, is not who said them, but what was said. Now, some of the verses include praises of Israel. For example, from its origins I see it rock-like, and from hills do I see it. Behold, there's a nation that will dwell in solitude and not be reckoned among the nations. How goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel, stretching out like brooks, like gardens by a river, like aloes planted by Hashem, like cedars by water. He perceived no iniquity in Jacob and saw no perversity in Israel. Hashem his God is with him, and the friendship of the king is in him. Behold, the people will arise like a lion cub and raise itself like a lion. And these words contain many levels of meaning, and 
For a proper understanding, they need to be studied and explored deeply. But here's the thing. Some of the verses of Bilaam's blessings are allusions to the final redemption, a time people call the end of days, including visions for both Israel and the nations. These blessings are deep mysteries, but we do know that they allude to important principles, to fundamental ideas that are central to our faith regarding the coming of the Messiah and the promised redemption. I shall see him, but not now. I shall look at him, but it is not near. A star has issued from Jacob, and a scepter bearer has risen from Israel. So open up your heart in the deepest way. In his main work, the Mishnah Torah, in the section where he writes about the belief in the arrival of the Messiah, the great Maimonides cites these very verses as the primary source. He cites Bilaam's words, a star has issued from Jacob and a scepter, a scepter bearer has risen from Israel. He cites these words as the classic and fundamental source in all of Torah of the prophecy of the Messianic arrival. Bilaam's prophecies are the source of this idea and nowhere else. This is a staggering question. How is it that of all people, we have Bilaam to thank for these verses and him not even intending to bless but to curse? And couldn't a nicer guy, a, a man of more noble intentions, have been the one to deliver these words? This question is huge, so powerful and so significant. Such an important idea as the coming of Mashiach, why did we have to hear it from Bilaam? So open up your heart in the deepest way ever. You know why we had to hear this from Bilaam? As if the Torah itself might not have told us about the final redemption and the end of days, as if the Torah maybe would have kept it to itself were it not for Bilaam spilling the beans? Exactly so. What is Torah? And what is its purpose? Why did Hashem bequeath it to Israel on behalf of the world? Torah means teaching, and God presented it in order to teach us how to live properly. Its aim is to guide a person in this world, to teach us proper and upright behavior. Its rules instruct us how we must interact and conduct ourselves with our fellow man, with our neighbors, with our family. How we are to gain mastery over ourselves, over our own wayward inner nature, so that we can become better people and thereby make the world a better place. Bilaam's view is that of an outsider who doesn't want to do the hard work of taking responsibility, but is entranced and attracted by the romance of the end of the story. He says, let my soul die the death of the upright and let my end be like his. But don't you see, open up your heart, these words of his are the giveaway. He sees a vision, the future of the coming world that's reserved for the righteous, so he says, oh, if only I could die like that. But the Torah says that you shall choose life. The Torah says about the mitzvot, you shall live by them. We don't focus on death. Neither do we focus or obsess on the end, but our job is in this world, this one, here and now. Bilam finds the death of the righteous attractive, but living like a righteous man is too much to ask. Living righteous takes commitment and integrity. This is so important to understand because the Torah does not concern itself with the end of days, but with these days. Belief in the messianic redemption and the world to come, all these are important and fundamental concepts but really open up your heart honestly to understand what I mean. They're important concepts, but to a true servant of Hashem, they are irrelevant. These concepts have nothing to do with our job, with what we have to accomplish in this world. As Rambam, Maimonides explains, we are not to obsess about these things. We are enjoined not to make them our main pursuit, not to spend too much time trying to understand these things. Many details of the end time scenario will only become clear as they happen. And he says, he says, the study of these things do not increase a person's love and fear of God, which of course is the main thing that counts. The development of proper love and fear of God will translate itself in our lives as action. When love and fear of God are actionable, we become better people through fulfilling his commandments and thus we draw closer to him and at the same time uplift all of creation. That's our job description. And everything else, frankly, is a distraction. Mashiach is coming, there's a time of redemption, there's a world to come. These are all very real and very dear and fundamental beliefs. Exciting, interesting, and compelling. Everybody wants to know when Mashiach is coming and what it will be like. If someone puts up a video on that subject, it will go viral. But none of this is Torah's goal. Hashem's entire concern in entrusting us with His Torah is this world, this life, instructing us how to live. The Holy Rav Kook of Blessed Memory takes it a step further. He writes that Torah is purpose, 
purposefully quiet about these things because otherwise people would abandon every other area of study. They would leave off everything about this world and focus their energies completely on the next world because it's so appealing, so compelling and attractive. And no one would be studying and learning about proper behavior between man and his fellow, loving one's neighbors, oneself, obligations of an individual and of society, monetary compensation for causing another person damage, and the world would be destroyed through lack of knowledge. But the Torah's concern is for how to behave justly in this world. So, we have to learn about these things from Bilam, who looked in and saw as an outsider, because he was not interested in making the effort to live a proper life, but only in an attractive death. He saw into the future and he saw Mashiach, he saw the redemption of all humanity, he saw the reward of the righteous in the world to come. And it all made him drool, it made him envious. It's easier to think about the future than it is to be busy with the obligations that make a difference now in our day-to-day -day reality. We believe in the coming of the Messiah and wait faithfully each day. But it doesn't change, and not by one iota, our first responsibility. The responsibility of each and every one of us to behave as upright, honest, ethical, moral, proper servants of Hashem, the God of all the worlds, the world to come, and first and foremost, the God of this world. Shalom, dear friends. Thank you so much for your support. We appreciate it so very much. It's only your support that enables Jerusalem Lights to continue its outreach of Torah for everyone.